This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to Hide.me slash Epicenter and sign up for a free account today. And by Shapeshift, with no account or sign-up required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell gems, counterparty, Monero, Dash, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to shapeshift.io to instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. I'm Meher Roy. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. So this is the first time that uh, the three of us are doing an episode together. I think we've talked about this idea a few times before, and uh, now it's indeed happening, which means you don't have a guest to look forward to, but hopefully... You know, us talking a little, little bit more and talking also a bit more about sort of our opinions of what's been going on will be interesting as well. And this will be kind of like a state of blockchain Bitcoin episode, you know, where we'll talk about what the situation is, what our views are, what we find interesting, uh, what projects we're paying attention to. And uh, yeah, so I think it will give you a, a good, interesting view of, of sort of what has been going on overall. Yeah, and very timely since it's the end of the year. You know, it's the perfect time to do one of these you know, gathering of, of the hosts episode. Exactly. So you, you can sit in front of the Christmas tree, have a, a nice glass of wine, uh, pat your dog and listen to us talking about the world of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. So to get started, I guess uh, one interesting way to sort of lead into this is to talk a little bit about Bitcoin itself. When we started this, it was at the beginning of 2014 and it was sort of uh, just after it had hit a thousand dollars and everybody was convinced that this was going to take over the world in no time. And now it's almost two years later. And I think a lot has happened in terms of Bitcoin startups becoming much more mature. Also in terms of a shift of attention that has been extremely pronounced in the last six months, where there's been a lot of interest from big companies, from banks, especially in the finance sector. And I think also a lot of this sort of startup interest has has a little bit shifted. I was at the Bruce VC in October, I think, the, the Bitcoin accelerator or the accelerator in Silicon Valley. And one thing that I thought was sort of striking was that there was just five Bitcoin startups there now, and they had 20 at the peak. I mean, the, the startups that were there were actually quite impressive. They were doing cool stuff. Um, but still, you know, one noticed is that that sort of um, wave has has slowed down a little bit and there's a there's a new wave and and like you mentioned this shift of attention from bitcoin to blockchain i see it sort of as a maturing of the industry you know of the sector and really blockchain becoming just another subset of of fintech yeah, that's a, I guess that's an interesting you know, discussion we can have later also a bit about those different areas. We're also seeing some really bizarre uh, turns in here. For example, uh, people starting to talk of Bitcoin as like the blockchain sort of trying to like, you know, capture that discussion by like acting as if when people talk about a blockchain in the, or blo- using blockchains in these other contexts, they're really talking about Bitcoin, which of course is complete nonsense. Well, and it's an interesting uh, sort of a marketing ploy, but in, there's not a lot of substance behind that. But you so mean a marketing a, ploy for Bitcoin? Yeah, it's a marketing ploy for Bitcoin. I think it's a... I'm not a big fan of that marketing ploy, but it, it, of course, it makes it confusing. And it also sort of illustrates that people have very different views on this, right? So some people, for them, it's, you know, blockchain and, and Bitcoin are like synonymous or the idea of a blockchain without Bitcoin, it, it doesn't compute. It like doesn't make sense. Um, and then obviously a lot of other people have a very different view on this and think that there is a lot of um, value to that. And I mean, I, I personally find that to sort of uh, 
negate the fact that blockchain is going to be used for something else is completely missing the point about what this technology really is. I mean, I think it was Vitalik that uh, posted something on Twitter saying that you know, blockchains are just database technologies. And at, at, at the core, you know, that's when we could when consider them to be like a new type of database. And the um, the 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 fact that so I guess sort of the, the core Bitcoin community doesn't really want to accept that or, or really take it in as, as a possibility just shows that perhaps there needs to be um, an opening of the mind <laughs> as to as to you know, what this can potentially become. Yeah, so uh, there's this quote I, I just read the other day, which I thought was expressing very well the the kind of state of almost the delusion that parts of the Bitcoin ecosystem are in. So this was something Barry Silver said. Barry Silver, obviously a very intelligent and highly accomplished guy who's also sort of a Bitcoin visionary. But he said, so all these banks are trying to get the best attributes of the Bitcoin blockchain without the Bitcoin. And ultimately, I think they're going to capitulate and revert back to the Bitcoin blockchain. So basically the idea that they, I'm not exactly sure what the idea is. So they're trying to use Bitcoin without Bitcoin. And then, you know, at some point they will realize how futile this has been. And they will come back to, to Bitcoin and say, oh, I, I am sorry. I, I will throw away my sinful past and s surrender to the God of Bitcoin. Uh, it's absurd. It's just not going to happen. And I, I think it's important to to realize that you know this is a different thing. Bitcoin is great, and I think Bitcoin is really important. And Bitcoin hopefully will succeed. But it the idea that if somebody wants to do something with blockchain, it has to be using Bitcoin. Uh, it's just it's not going to happen. On the one side, I agree that if somebody like the blockchain by itself minus the token might be uh, might be useful in many circumstances in the legacy financial system but my feeling is that the fundamental invention is public economic consensus the idea that hundreds of hundreds of computers around the world can coordinate to do something and maintain a, a currency is the fundamental idea personally i don't when i look back at the year 2015 and i see this shift from like cryptocurrency and public like focus from changing from cryptocurrency to uh, um, stuff for banks i tend to think that it's it's just like a, a very sh short shift like if you imagine the diesel engine was invented in 1895 and uh, we had to wait 13 years for the model t 1908 and we had to wait another three years 1911 for the first pet good petrol pumps and we had to wait until 1920 to have a nationwide system of roads and petrol pumps so that the engine could be actually commercialized. Now, if you think about it, if the diesel engine was invented in 1895 and suddenly in 1901, people concluded that the diesel engine wasn't interesting and something else was maybe applying this chassis of cars to other things was interesting, then maybe it's just like a temporary blip in... Uh, in the in the in the focus and i think i think this year is like that for public economic consensus we have all kind of moved away from it yes in in terms of media in terms of developer effort but i but i suspect this is like a temporary dip and the and it's it's the it's the real invention it's the big invention and we need many more things for it to really get commercialized things like stable currencies low latency systems so I personally, I don't, I don't, I tend to think like, yeah, bank rate blockchains are interesting, but like Bitcoin and Ethereum, do, those are the, those are the game changing revolutionary things. And they'll come back in a big way in 2016 or 2017, maybe 2018. I don't know when. I mean, the way I think about it is that the potential to have, to remove third parties and to have... It's basically a blockchain is a fundamental solution to coordination problems, right? And I think that has a huge number of applications that, and it's, it's really hard right now to predict 
where are you know where are those areas where they have a huge amount of utility and i think that what we will see at least it's my expectation that we will have a, a huge number first of all a huge number of blockchains in use like millions and i also think that they will sort of range from at the one end blockchains that are centralized so and and a lot of people will be like what is the point of a centralized blockchain i think there actually is a point of a centralized blockchain if let's say we as epicenter bitcoin we would say we're going to run our operations on a blockchain right we're going to really put the logic of the company on a blockchain well all of a sudden we could prove to others how you know we could have a record of everything that's going on inside the company so that could be interesting for example, for shareholders, it could be interesting for, let's say we did some revenue split with you, Meher, and well, well, you could verify everything. Or let's say a third party wants to certify that, yes, this is a, a company, a bank maybe says, okay, do I want to give a loan to Epicenter Bitcoin? Well, if their operations, we can validate them. Well, that, that's, that changes a lot. Or let's say an auditor uh, says, okay, let's do real-time auditing. Not, no longer like at the end of the year, we inspect all your records. No, we will help you to like put all the business processes on a blockchain. You know, we run a node on that or we uh, have receive all the transactions or something like that and we can do real-time auditing. That's really interesting and a lot of novel, powerful applications. And then on the other end of the spectrum, right, you have the idea of public chains of like a decentralized currency or like uh, applications that cannot be censored, prediction markets and all that. Super interesting as well. Amazing, right? And then I think you can have a lot in between where it is a group running a network together. And I think we will have simply all of that. And it's, I, I think it's my expectation that we will be, but this might be very wrong. But I think we might start more in the enterprise context and that it will take longer for the big public chains to succeed. Also because they're harder problems, right? It's, it's hard to get uh, consensus right when you have in the face of basically uh, attackers that are unknown and trying to take you down and stuff like that. It's easier to, to solve these problems when you have known parties that are part participating in that. But I think, I think we, this, you know, there's a whole range that is going to happen and that whole range that is really interesting. Yeah. I, I, a couple of things I want to mention about what you just said. So, well, one is this problem of consensus that we've seen over the last year with the scalability debate, that, that, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And uh, that's really hard to coordinate. And we're still trying to find ways to do that. Maybe those those will come. Maybe we'll we'll find solutions to to those problems, uh, and and for governance as well. Um, the other thing regarding uh, the Bitcoin blockchain specifically, or pri uh, public blockchains in general, is uh, the the question of regulation right now. It's can enterprise really use this uh, for regulated industries, and. Um, and then there's, 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 there's a part about payment as well. So Bitcoin has a payment system. Um, if, if we can't come to, uh, if, 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 if basically Bitcoin can't be used for regulated activities and it doesn't find a real use for the currency, then I think it, it, it will cease to exist or it'll become sort of this really sort of niche thing that uh, is used for very specific things or you know, perhaps buying drugs or that kind of thing. <laughs> um, but what, but, what but you, unless, unless those yeah. two, unless those two, we can get over those two hurdles. So either regulation, uh, the regulation issue being solved or Bitcoin really being used as a currency. Um, I, I, in, in the current context of things, I don't really see it as having much of a future just outside of a, of a niche currency that's used by, uh, you know, subset of people on the internet. Let's take a short break and talk about hide.me. You know, setting up a VPN on multiple devices can be complicated. Let's say you want to do like three devices and you have 
10 different exit nodes that you want to configure. Well, that's 30 different configurations that you have to do manually in each of those devices OS, and that can take a long time. Hide.me makes this super easy with their apps. So they have apps for Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and Windows Phone. So you just install the app, log in, and boom, you're ready to use VPN with Hide.me. So this is perfect if you're traveling, you just install the app on your devices, and say you're using public Wi-Fi, you turn on the app, you connect, and you're completely protected against hacking, man in the middle attacks, or any type of malicious activity. And of course, the apps work with their free plan. To try out their free plan, head to hide.me slash epicenter. It includes two gigabytes of data, which is more than enough to keep you protected when you go traveling. It also includes three exit nodes in Singapore, Amsterdam, and Montreal. And if you use our URL, so hide.me slash epicenter, it's going to give you 35% off if you ever decide to sign up for a premium account. And their premium account includes unlimited data. It includes up to five devices connected simultaneously. So you can put your grandmother using a VPN, even your dog's tablet, you can put on a VPN. Uh, and you can use any of their exit nodes and they've got 30 exit nodes all over the world. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. So give it a try and we would like to thank Hightop.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So regarding the first thing, you know, Bitcoin, whether Bitcoin can be used for regulated activity, obviously it can, right? I mean, companies are accepting it and other companies are building things on top of it. I think it is, it's also obviously true that it creates complications, right? I mean, we know, we see that we run Epicenter Bitcoin as a purely Bitcoin business. I, am, you know, the accounting is going to be a nightmare. Uh, and, and so there is obviously a problem here. Also with Ethereum, right? The companies having to deal with ether and gas, uh, it creates problems, right? What's the risk management going to say about that? Like, so, but that being said, it doesn't mean it can't be used. I, I tend to think that the applications of cryptocurrencies haven't really come yet. Um, so, so, I mean, in 2014, when I look back, I see this whole trend that people tried to jump into the remittance market. And then uh, people also tried to jump into the idea that Bitcoin will be the currency of the unbanked. And both of those ideas have kind of failed. And uh, if you look at the fundamental reasons why they failed, um, in the remittance market, the, the kind of reason was um, that people on the other side, like if you transfer into Canada to the Philippines, people in Philippines did not have a Bitcoin economy to spend those Bitcoins in. Yes, yeah, the so problem you, of the last mile. Yeah, the problem of the last mile. And therefore, because there wasn't an economy there, you needed all of those conversion charges, those networks, and it came came out that there wasn't any advantage to using Bitcoin like that. And from from the perspective of the unbanked market, many people were bullish about it, Barry Silbert included. And um, I think I think it's it was premature to target the unbanked market because simply because me being an Indian, I I I, I see that in India. Indians only use stuff that it has is successful in the West. Uh, the 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 people over like hundreds like hundreds of years of technology evolution have kind of observed that what becomes successful like whatever is successful in the West just copy that. Don't try to innovate, copy. And it's it's like a hundred years of mentality. And so I I was actually very skeptical that uh, people in India would start to use Bitcoin. And this is kind of true. Uh, because even if I look at kind of my network in India, which is the very educated class of India, even they don't use Bitcoin today. So the idea that the underbanked are going to be the first people to adopt Bitcoin kind of seemed always a bit foolish to me. Um, and kind of these things have borne out. Uh, so so we see we, we are kind of in this state where cryptocurrencies have not found a brilliant application if you go beyond like the, the dark net markets but I I, I, I I tend to think I didn't think that um, this will change uh, and there are there are a couple of reasons why this will change first reason is uh, it, it is 
it is very hard to develop with Bitcoin. So it was really hard to build applications with, with, with Bitcoin. And there were very few developers that could actually do it. If I look at Ethereum, the, the ease of development has increased by an order of magnitude, truly. That's, that's, that's a really big jump. And, uh, and now that I look back, Bitcoin kind of did miss a lot of the features that Ethereum has built. And now it becomes easier to build applications with cryptocurrencies. And, and I think in the next two or three years, we will see a lot of applications. Many of them initially will be, uh, will tend to be things that are illegal in certain jurisdictions. Like, for example, you could use uh, cryptocurrencies to create new kinds of gambling markets. And I think that is a huge market out there. So um, there, there will be many applications for cryptocurrencies in the future. And uh, we just haven't discovered them. Now, in the Ethereum ecosystem, what was also interesting is um, the idea of the decentralized autonomous organization that is a group of people spread around the world building a company on the Ethereum network itself. And uh, what this kind of thing could allow them to do is, you know, you have a distributed company like people, people like in India, Israel, Germany, US, like collaborating together with a, with a, with a distributed company. I think these kinds of ideas will come and they will create a demand for uh, the usage of cryptocurrencies and, and we'll get there. Uh, it's just going to take us time. Uh, this is going to be, there's going to be something that develops over the long run. And I'm, I'm personally, I'm not so, I'm not so bear, bearish about Bitcoins. Uh, crashing in value. I think uh, digital scarcity is important. Recently, I, I saw uh, that a few economists from uh, from Bermuda have proposed that the Central Bank of Bermuda hold Bitcoin as a reserve currency. Now, Barry Silbert himself was advocating this in, 2000, in 2014. He, he predicted that the first uh, at the end of 2014, the first central bank, there will be, be one central bank that keeps Bitcoin as a reserve currency. And suddenly that idea, which was a very wacko idea that nobody would have, nobody believed except for Barry Silbert himself. Suddenly that wacko idea has gone from a wacko idea to kind of a mainstream idea by, by having two economists from the central bank of Bermuda itself proposing to do that. And I... I think I think these kinds of things are going to happen. Uh, they'll take time, and it'll be a two-decade game. But I think we'll have uses, uh, and I think uh, digital scarcity is valuable. Yeah, no, I, I mean I completely agree with you. I, I think we we can talk about this a bit more in a second. When, you know, when we talk about the block size and the future of Bitcoin and all, but. I think for Bitcoin, simply not to fail is a huge success, right? If Bitcoin is still going to be around in 10 years and it's going to be, you know, functioning and doing transactions and stuff, even if it doesn't live up to a lot of its uh, promises, that will be uh, a huge, a huge thing. I mean, what I mean is simply having like a... a a digital gold type thing that's re removed from the control of any government that's that's pretty huge right and and i think there will be a lot of applications i mean you mentioned it's totally possible that central banks will stop stop uh, start holding that it's possible that it will become something like that is simply a part of a you know portfolio distribution of asset managers also it can have a lot of uh, functions in terms of people protecting their asset with that you know when people use gold for example uh, or us dollars in countries like argentina or other countries with not such a good currency you know that they say okay we'll hold some money in bitcoin or a tax evasion i think is that the sort of you know you there used to be the swiss bank account no but that doesn't really exist anymore but maybe bitcoin will be the swiss bank account of the future uh, and so, th so there are a lot of applications for sure, and and there is definitely a role for a totally decentralized, censorship-resistant currency like electronic cash. I think that's a huge, a huge thing and a hugely important thing. And it's also something where it's really hard to displace Bitcoin now. I think 
if Bitcoin doesn't succeed, it will be super hard for someone else to come in and say, okay, well, here's the, the Bitcoin, the successor to Bitcoin. Because there will always be the question, well, if, if Bitcoin didn't make it, then what about this new thing, right? Because it looked like Bitcoin was going to make it for years. And now this new thing is here, but, you know, can we trust that this isn't also going to be displaced by like some thing after it? Because this really depends on it having long-term value. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin only works as like digital gold if you believe that it's still going to be here in 10 years, right? But if, if you're all always worried that, well, maybe it won't, maybe the next one will come and displace it, then that's not going to work. So I think that, that that trust thing is actually quite fickle and it could go away easily. So I, I think that that's going to be a key thing. And, and that's actually also, and maybe that's something we can talk about right now, is the sort of state of Bitcoin when you talk about uh, development and the block size debate. I remember we had Mike Hearn on this podcast in, I just looked it up before, in June 2014, and he sort of said, oh, Bitcoin development has ground, ground to a complete halt. And there was a lot of arguments about that. People got very um, innovated, very controversial discussions he created. But my impression is now, or a year and a half later, uh, he was right. It really has has come to that. How do you guys see that? Um, well, just before before uh, we go into this, I want to say that uh, I think you made some good points uh, just earlier, and I didn't want to sound bearish about Bitcoin. Like I really do think that Bitcoin is great, and that we need this sort of decentralized uh, censorship resistance currency. I just I'm, I'm slightly pessimistic about the enthusiasm that some people have that it, you know, we're already there and it's there. Like there's still a lot of hurdles to go through and, 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 and we'll, there will be some challenges if Bitcoin wants to be successful. And, you know, the current shift to blockchain by enterprise and seemingly enterprise will use public blockchains for most of what they're going to be doing. Um, leads me to question what role Bitcoin will have as a currency and as a platform on which we can develop applications if, uh, if most of the work is going into public uh, private blockchains. Um, so you, so what was your question again, Brian? About the state of development, right? Yeah, so state of development, of course, that also sort of ties into the, the block size debate that you know, we have had on the show quite a few times from, from different sides. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have a whole lot of opinions about the state of development because I don't, I don't follow the core development very much. I think that the block size debate, though, I mean, the fact that, um, you know, all, all of the core devs and a lot of the industry players that are building infrastructure have been able to get together to events and, and talk about these problems and try to move forward is a step in the right direction. Well, as opposed I, to... I'm not sure if that's an accurate description, no, because, for example, Mike Hearn and Gavin Andreessen, they didn't go to the, the second one. I think Gavin went to the first one, but uh, so there's... Whether there really is progress there, I think that is... Uh... So here's how I think about this. I was in February of this year... I was in Spain for a few weeks and sort of working a little bit from there, but I had quite a bit of time. And so one of the things I did was I read the, this book of Satoshi, which was all his early forum posts. And it was quite interesting because, you know, Satoshi had always been this figure that I had never read anything off except the white paper. And then, you, you know, you read about this early emergence of Bitcoin, all the questions then. And the thing I came away with, the impression was really that Bitcoin was just a proof of concept, right? He just wanted to prove that this can be done. Uh, and Bitcoin was an amazingly successful proof of concept, a brilliant proof of concept. I mean, there's probably never been a better proof of concept in like ever, but it was a proof of concept developed by one guy, mostly, at least initially, with uh, very little information. I mean, he didn't know he didn't know about mining pools, probably, right? He didn't know about ASIC hardware. He didn't know how it was going to be used. There was all sorts of things he just had no idea about. 
And so he made all these choices because they seemed like, you know, reasonable choices at the time or good enough choices or just they had to make a choice because you can, if he had spent, uh, you know, six months really thinking about what's going to be the game theory of like this random variable, like three years down the line, you know, you just can't do that. So he just made a bunch of choices and then Bitcoin started and well, it was a very successful proof of concept, still running now, six years later. But that doesn't mean that all the choices he made were very good choices. I think he made a lot of choices that were turned out in retrospect to be pr pretty poor choices. And I think if Bitcoin is to be successful, it is just absolutely necessary that there is a sort of an openness and a flexibility from the part of the community to say, okay, which of these choices were good choices and which of these were just, you know, reasonable looking choices at the time that didn't turn out to be so good and then change them to have, uh, you know, success in the long run. And unfortunately, I see very little willingness and openness to consider any changes. And then even with something like as simple as increasing the block size is huge discussions and doesn't seem to be possible to do that. And in my view, we would have to go much further actually than just to look at, you know, what's the right block size. I think we should look at other things that, you know, people generally consider like unthinkable. I think Bitcoin NG sounds like uh, something one should probably look into. That seems like a, a really good idea. Maybe there's some problems with it. I don't know, but at least we should be open to something like that. I think, you know, the block reward that it's half every four years, I think that was a, definitely a mistake. I think if it should, if at all, it should be continuously decreasing. But quite frankly, I think one should go even further and think about shouldn't there be a constant block reward? Because I have never seen a convincing argument how transaction fees are going to replace the block reward. And it just doesn't seem to be going anywhere good. But there's no willingness to, con to like consider any such fundamental changes to Bitcoin. And that's something that worries me. So the, I guess the question is, and why is there no willingness to consider these things? And, uh, you know, there's, I think there's sort of two camps. There's one camp that thinks that Satoshi made all the right choices and one that thinks that he, that he didn't. I, I, I think there's no willingness to, a, a huge part is just inertia. You know, there's just a decision was made and, uh, and that's just, you know, the decision that's there now. And it's super hard because there's such a distributed network to like get people to agree on doing anything, you know, whether it's something meaningful or not. Uh, and that's, that's just the way it is. And, and on top of that, you have like disagreements and people don't like each other and people are really rude with each other and people like attack each other personally. And that just leads to a, an environment where you, you know, it's going to be really hard to get any kind of agreement. And, and then of course, then the one side also in this debate says, well, we can't do any changes unless everybody agrees. And in an, in an environment where you're never going to get everybody to agree, you know, that just creates a, a toxic place where essentially nothing happens. And of course, one can't overlook as well. Uh, the reluctance to change is also very much fueled by fear of one losing a whole lot of money if the choices are bad and the Bitcoin price crashes. I think that if people have... Uh, quite a few, you know, a lot of Bitcoins and they're looking at this and saying that my, you know, my, 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 uh, my Bitcoins might lose their value, then of course they're going to be reluctant to making any changes at no, all. No, that's absolutely true. And, and, and a lot of, I don't think a lot of people talk about that. No, people, I, I that's absolutely true. And, and that's, uh, that's also a really valid reason why you'd say, okay, everyone be careful with making changes. So it's certainly, it's certainly good that it's hard to make changes. It's certainly good that, you know, changes are carefully considered and all because you know, it's a lot of it, a lot is at stake. But I would say on that spectrum of being like aggressive and adapting Bitcoin for, 
whatever the environment is today in the future versus being like really careful and conservative and not changing anything because anything you might break something like we are way too far on the conservative side so i think i think that's true if i if i look back at the year and uh, previous two years um really no no big changes have happened in fact the last big one i can i can imagine is multi signature and after that i don't see any any great changes happening that said uh, initially uh, this used to worry me i used to think well bitcoin development has ground to a halt and that's kind of dangerous and uh, when i actually when i went to the ethereum devcon this year and i saw what the ethereum guys were up to and and i had the feeling uh, in terms of pure innovation ethereum has jumped ahead of bitcoin uh, by a very large extent i mean um, it's 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 probably uh, it's probably the case that the ethereum ecosystem as in terms of the core protocol is probably like 10 times more innovative than the in, than the bitcoin one and also if you look at the ethereum system it's it's led by vitalik who's 21 year old and generally it's it's uh generally the i mean it's it's human nature the older you get the more conservative you become and uh, maybe having a 21 year old at the head of the organization helps with ethereum because they are not conservative at all and i and i love that about the ethereum ecosystem so if you if you really look at it in a competitive light you have bitcoin that's kind of becoming this uh, thing that's very hard to change and on the other side you have ethereum that is moving extremely fast and being really innovative taking really good risks and and the first kind of the first uh, the first reaction you can have as a bitcoin holder is you worry about bitcoin that oh my god i i have i don't know whatever percent of my savings in bitcoin and i see this other currency coming and that is much more innovative and uh, will my, will 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 bitcoin die out because of that that was my kind of the first kind of worry i had uh, back in the middle of the year then i actually uh, there was another change in perspective um now i think that bitcoin actually doesn't need to be innovative to succeed uh that bitcoin should perhaps just uh just 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 hold the hold the fort and i'll and i'll kind of explain why i think of it like like this right now see the thing is uh on the first the first thing to observe is um uh, in bitcoin uh change is really hard because that there's a lot of money at stake now there's this i don't know 6 billion dollars of market cap it's not small and if you were if you were somewhere someone were like vladimir your career is made you are the bitcoin core developer uh your career is really made you uh you have become famous and uh, you you'll get good jobs you'll get good offers once you step down from that role and if you try to make a very big change to bitcoin and it fails and bitcoin gets destroyed then basically your career is also destroyed with it because that mistake will always be associated with you as the core developer if i was vladimir then if i made made a huge change to bitcoin and bitcoin ended up failing in some way then that's on me and my career is destroyed but if i do nothing bitcoin stays it just maintains maintains its value then i'm fine then i'm already you know i have i have already a name as a bitcoin core developer that's a really good tag to have for the future so i think in terms of game theory if you look at all of these developers that are there uh, they are generally uh, you know say 35 to 50 mostly uh, and and they're quite happy in their positions and i i wouldn't begrudge them that um, so in terms of game theory it doesn't make sense for any of these people to actually go and do something uh, really radical whereas if you look at the ethereum ecosystem they have to be radical because uh, if they are not radical they are not differentiated from bitcoin in any way so if you if you just look at the game theory of this uh, it makes uh, like bitcoin as the as the big brother naturally tends to be more conservative so uh, the second point now is if you look at ethereum um, like i love the way ethereum is innovative i love the way they take risks um but still 
as a holder of cryptocurrencies and as a as a decent decently sized holder of cryptocurrencies i can't actually bring about to sell all my bitcoins the thing is bitcoin has a claim as digital gold like the number 21 million is famous uh, it's in the minds of many people now if you look at ethereum their proof of work schedule is like you know there'll be like billions of ether they start off with 70 million every year you add 70 million and slowly it, it goes to around i think 3 billion ether in 2040 or something ether does not ether does not give the feeling to me of being digital gold so and i can't sell bitcoin even though i think ethereum is more innovative because in Bitcoin, I feel this is digital gold. So I think for me, these are two different niches. One is like conservative digital gold that you know will keep working because nobody's making any change to it and there's no risks taken with the system. So it's like, you know, you can expect this 21 million to stay and, I, and, I, and that fulfills one niche for me. And then there's Ethereum on the other side, which is this young kid on the street taking the brilliant risks, being innovative, and building a currency that's not trying to be digital gold, it's trying to have, you know, billions of them. Uh, and, and inflation will be there like far into the future. So these are two different points in the ecosystem. And Bitcoin can actually never play Ethereum's game. I mean, I don't think Bitcoin has it in it, in, in it, in it to be as innovative as Ethereum. So maybe they should stop trying to be like that and just become the old conservative digital gold niche and let ethereum be the innovative niche and we are all great we are all better that way because that way i can hold bitcoin and ether and have something conservative and have something risky and have a beautiful portfolio yeah so a few, a few things here so first of all regarding ethereum I think that really remains to be seen whether Ethereum will be able to like adapt and change and take risks in the future. I mean, it's it's easy to do that, of course, during the development stage and before you've actually launched. And it has not been very long that they've launched. And they've had some advantages there. And, and, and maybe they've made the right choices so that they won't have to make those huge changes in the future. But, you know, one of them that w is planned is the, the switch to proof of stake. And that will be a huge change. And I am, I am personally a little bit skeptical how you know how well that is going to go because then you will also have you know a huge you know, f fraction, for example, of the, the Ethereum miners who will have a strong incentive to be against that. And so I, I think it really remains to be seen how well Ethereum can adapt. I think that's the, the judgment on that is still out. The other thing, I agree with you, right, that there's sort of two different things and you can totally see both of them being successful and then fulfilling very different functions. It's just that in my view, the, the prospect of, you know, Bitcoin not making any changes, hence it will not go anywhere and it will keep existing. I think those two don't go together for me. But for me, it's for Bitcoin to just remain in that niche of being like the digital gold and uh, sort of electronic cash, it has to make changes, right? So I think we, we differ there. And I think it's actually important to be aggressive and try to make changes there uh, for Bitcoin to retain that role without trying to be like Ethereum. That is nonsensical. Like I think the idea that a lot of these applications will be built on Bitcoin doesn't make sense. I think it's, it's enough to just say it needs to be secure, but changes need to be made for that. I don't think Bitcoin will be secure without changes. Uh, it also needs to be able to scale, right? And to actually do more transactions and do them securely. And, and, and that's, that's enough, I think, as goals. If you can do that, that's great, right? Uh, the idea of having... Um, you know, side chains and all kinds of complex applications on there. I, I don't think it's essential for the success of Bitcoin. So, so the reason you, you, you believe Bitcoin needs to innovate to be successful is, uh, is, is you think that even to hold on to the digital gold niche, so your argument is even to hold on to the digital gold niche, it needs to innovate and find applications because 
otherwise how how is it going to be secure in the future given that block rewards are going to fall to zero yeah so that- there's a few things i'm concerned about security is definitely a huge one i i have a hard time bitcoin i mean it's pretty simple right the, the security model of of bitcoin but you know, if you look at proof of work, then the security depends a lot on like, you know, how distributed is that mining power? And also just how expensive is it to attack Bitcoin? And if the revenues of miners go to zero, then, well, it is very cheap to attack Bitcoin. And, you know, with the block of work going down, it's there, there are some unsolved problems there, and I think the security is definitely one thing I'm concerned about. And the other thing is just uh, you know the the scalability, right? The block size I think needs to increase. Even even though I think Lightning Network and things like that are very interesting, but so I think from those two angles, it's it's necessary to make uh, to make changes, and those might not be crazy radical changes when you look at it from sort of the Ethereum angle, right, where you've done all kinds of different things, but there are crazy radical changes that are necessary, I think, when you look at it in terms of the current Bitcoin debate, where even going from one megabyte to eight or something like that creates a huge amount of controversy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, perhaps, yeah, perhaps these kinds of changes are needed. Um, I mean, like I've kind of always thought that, uh, like Bitcoin will succeed as digital gold if, if it will succeed or it will fail. And, um, kind of my impression is that if Bitcoin succeeds, succeeds as digital gold, um, uh, it really doesn't need to scale transaction volume for a decade or two. Like, let's take an example. Uh, today you have, uh, Today you have 25 Bitcoin block reward, right? At a at a price of at a market cap of uh, say five billion. So that that is around like 400 to 500 million dollars worth of revenue for the miners, and most of it is seniorage. Nothing like these. There's there's no transaction fee element. It's a very small. Well, maybe one percent is transaction fee today. 99 percent is seniorage, but you have around say 400 million dollars worth of incentive for miners to mine. And if I actually look at digital gold, the idea that there's something that's limited, something that can't be confiscated, something that's censorship resistant, um, if it if that idea is valuable and if it succeeds on that scale, I easily see the market cap of Bitcoin going to sixty billion dollars, 10 x in 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 ten years. I'm not saying next year. I'm I'm not a short termist. I I I'll say in ten years. If you look at ten years from now. Uh, the kind of block reward would have gone down from 25 to 12 and a half to 6.25 to 3.125 to 1.5 1.5 something per 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 block. But if the value of the Bitcoin has has increased 10 times, then actually even with that reduced block reward, even 12 years into the future, we have 400 million dollars worth of incentive for the miners. Yeah. So. So if 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 Bitcoin succeeds as digital gold, I, what I'm trying to say is Bitcoin has a strategy. Like, don't try to be anything else. Just try to be digital gold. Let the Lightning guys handle the transaction volume. Don't even try to scale transaction volume. Just try to be the safe digital gold, and see if the market is willing to accept that as an idea. If the market does, it's easily conceivable that it goes from six billion to sixty billion, and that kind of for 15 years, you don't need to worry about security of the blockchain if that happens. Yeah, I, I totally disagree with that. I think you're you're missing a huge <laughs> point, which is that <laughs> when the, the market cap of Bitcoin goes to 60 billion, which I think is totally possible, right? The problem is also, it's not just that the revenues of the miners stay the same. It's also that the incentive and the payoff to attack Bitcoins go up, right? So the only way for the security of Bitcoin to scale up is that the miners' revenues have to scale up along with the market cap. Otherwise, it gets increasingly unstable and insecure. So I think that doesn't work that way, at least not in my view.
Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Shapeshift. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade altcoins and they now support over 50 of the most popular altcoins that you know and love. When you want to trade altcoins, of course you can do it the hard way, which means creating an account and an exchange, giving them a bunch of personal information, depositing your money, putting your trades through, and growing old and hating life waiting for those trades to go through. Or you can do it the easy way, which means no accounts, no signups, and getting it done in less than one minute. So Shapeshift now also has that Lens extension for Firefox and Chrome. Now what the Lens extension does is once you have it installed, it's going to show a tiny little fox next to every Bitcoin address that's going to appear in your browser. Now you may say, great, I want the fox, but actually this isn't just to foxify your browser experience. It has more functionality than that. If you manage to click on one of those things, then what's going to happen is it's going to pounce out this pop-up window and Shapeshift is going to give you the option to pay that Bitcoin address in any of the altcoins they support. Now, if you want to add that lens to your browser experience, you can get that at the Chrome Web Store or Firefox add-ons. Just look for Shapeshift lens and you can add more Fox to your life. We'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epson and Bitcoin. I want to jump in here and, and talk about the, the scalability problem from the transaction volume perspective. So the, the way that I see it, after after what you just said, Mayor, I, I see it a bit differently now where um, uh, the transaction volumes, if Bitcoin is to be simply digital gold, and one can assume that if it only serves that function, we don't need crazy high transaction volumes. Um, conceivably, you know, they could be uh, handled by something like uh, Lightning Lightning Network or uh, perhaps a small block size increase. The the transaction volumes that we're anticipating on the Bitcoin blockchain are mostly you know transactions being executed by protocols on top um, or uh, transactions using up return to uh, notarize data into the blockchain. So if Bitcoin remains as only digital gold and all these other Bitcoin 2.0 applications and everything else that we're building on top of the blockchain goes to Ethereum and private blockchains, then perhaps in that scenario, we wouldn't need extra transaction volume. But like you said, Mayor, the, the, the market needs to establish that Bitcoin um, is, is digital gold and that's all it is. And all these other applications, well, we need to use Ethereum to do that or we need to use private blockchains to do that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think, I think the, I think the bigger uncertainty in my mind is exactly that. Like, uh, will the market accept the value proposition of digital gold, like pure digital gold? Forget about all of these other things. Uh, if the market can accept that, I think, um, I think Bitcoin has a chance. Even, even, like, even it being completely conservative. But I think the risk for Bitcoin is uh, like what Brian says is right. Um, the risk for Bitcoin is that the market doesn't accept it as digital gold. And then this kind of niche falls away. And then uh, in terms of creativity, Bitcoin has ceded ground to Ethereum. I, I believe it has ceded ground already. It's not a question of the future. Uh, but I actually... I actually look at it slightly differently because I am not really worried about the market not accepting Bitcoin as or the value of digital gold. I think there is a value there and I, I, am, I am really optimistic that if Bitcoin solves some of the fundamental challenges it has and just exists as this alternative way of storing value and transmitting value, uh, I think there's going to be a market for that. I'm really bullish on that. And I'm also, I think it can be a huge market in terms of, you know, just some asset, uh, another asset type, you know, and, and, you know, as you mentioned, you know, a central bank holding that. But the, where I'm less bullish is, you know, whether, whether the, the technical requirements to do that and the security and, and those things will be sufficient. That's that's where my fear is. My fear is not that there isn't a market for for a digital gold. I think there is. It's interesting. It's 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 very interesting how how it's like with Bitcoin everyone sees the thing a bit differently. Um 
and and kind of that's 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 kind of the challenge as well right in in all of these proposals it's uh it's everyone sees it differently i i don't really have an answer to it i mean my my gut feeling is bitcoin will find it really hard to evolve um like seeing the debates this year i i'm uh, i'm i'm pretty pretty skeptical of of uh, of quick evolution but but let's see like maybe you are right brian uh maybe it needs to evolve beyond the current state in order to be successful today's magic word is triangle t r i a n g l e head over to let's talk bitcoin.com to sign in enter the magic word and claim your part of the listener reward Yes. So another topic that I I wanted to to brush on because I think it's really important and well I think views differ on on how important it is or if it is important. Some people clearly think it's not important, which is the 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 censorship that's going on on um, our Bitcoin and uh, actually I don't know if it's going on on Bitcoin Talk as well because I've never really used Bitcoin Talk. But so, so before this episode, I was briefly looking at the sort of the stats and uh, got some estimates over. And our Bitcoin has about 500,000 monthly uniques. So that's the Bitcoin Reddit for, for those who know our Bitcoin. And uh, that's more than Coindesk. So most likely, this is the most frequented source of Bitcoin information and media um, that there is. And... The moderator of our Bitcoin is a guy named Thamos, Thamos, I think, or something like that. Uh, and I mean, my in my view, the guy is completely crazy and uh, like a sociopath. And uh, he has the view that uh, basically uh, other implementations of Bitcoin are an altcoin, which seems to be the most nonsensical view one could hold. And he has the view that, you know, people like Gavin and Dreesen and Mike Hearn arguing for a BIP 101, so bigger block size, and now having Bitcoin XT as a sort of competing implementation that this is an altcoin. I mean, I can see why one is against it, but calling it an altcoin. And, and so he censors massively, right, any, basically any other opinion on there. And the guy also controls Bitcoin Talk, but I, I don't know if something similar is going on there or not. So and Bitcoin Talk is, again, is about the same uh, traffic volume as Coindesk. So this is a huge amount of the where people consume media is controlled by this guy. And this guy is basically massively abusing his position to just censor like one side of the debate. Personally, I think this is a huge problem. I think this is a absolutely massive problem. And, um, and the problem here too is it's so hard to move away from that, right? It's just that Bitcoin Reddit, that's the Bitcoin Reddit. Like you can't just start a new Bitcoin Reddit and like, because people massively disagree with this guy everybody switches over it, it doesn't really work like that and yeah that's i think it's a big problem and, and i've also been personally sort of highly i must say irritated that i have seen a, a real lack of people standing up against that from the side who is basically supported by Thamos. but so basically uh, you know the people who don't want to who are against bip 101 against Bitcoin XT, that they just sort of are, well, you know, it's his choice. And, um, and you know, if, if he does that, it's, it's nothing to do with us. And, and he, because, of course, they benefit from that. And I think that's something I find, um, I find extremely hypocritical. You know, if you sort of on the one hand, you say, OK, I put in all this work to, you know, make Bitcoin great, censorship resistant, uh, currency and at the same time sort of benefit and don't stand up against the main media sites being completely censored of other opinions. This is something I, I think it's a big problem and, and unfortunately there seems to be no way out of it. Yeah, I, I agree with you that it's very hypocritical and somewhat ironic that uh, Bitcoin on one hand is 
is a currency that is uh, meant to be open and censorship resistant and all this. And on the other hand, you have this kind of this kind of crap happening, um, you know, on Bitcoin, Reddit, and and other places like you mentioned. Uh, I, my opinion on this is that I I think you're right that it you know being the primary place where people get Bitcoin information is you know it it does make this a big problem right if, if if this one place where a lot of people are getting their information about bitcoin is completely censored and they don't have access to information anywhere else or they don't have access to the information simply because they don't check anywhere else well that's that's an issue but uh i also think that the people that a lot of the people that go on the bitcoin reddit and um are very active there like he's preaching to that crowd like they're also, uh, that also kind of agree with that, um, that you know, the block size shouldn't be increased. No, that's not true at all. It's not true? Most people don't agree with him at all. I mean, there's okay. like sticky posts, you know, where like new moderation rules, like these are not tolerated. And like 90% of people downvote him. Like any, any, uh, the people are massively against uh, what the guy is doing there. Okay. But I don't, he spend, a lot of, care. I don't spend enough time in Bitcoin Reddit then. Uh, he also, he made this comment somewhere. I, I remember seeing that, that he was like, because people were like, well, everybody is against you. Nobody wants the censorship here. And he was like, well, if, I mean, if 90 people, 90% of the users don't, want the censorship then 90 percent of the users should go somewhere else you know so he doesn't care about that oh then then they should then you know yeah uh, that's yeah, easy to say true. but it's almost impossible to do right i mean that's the same exact same reason why bitcoin might have a great chance of being the sort of digital gold is because simply it's there and there's inertia and it's like baked in and like it's what people use and that's what people turn to it's the same thing with this so the idea that, okay, you can just like start a competing Reddit. I mean, people try it, right? There's Bitcoin PTC, there's Bitcoin, there are Bitcoin XT and stuff, but nobody uses it, right? Because it's, it's just like impossible to get everybody to switch something else. And uh, I mean, that's, that was, I had the discussion with some of the, the block stream guys about this, because I felt like they should stand up against this. And they should like say, hey, they must like, you know, this, you can't do this. Uh, and they were like, well, you know, everybody can start their own Reddit, which is of course true, but it's also like, it's a complete nonsense because the, it's so hard to displace that. There's just, it's like coin market cap, right? It wasn't a great site. I mean, it's super simple. It just does one thing, it does it okay. But, you know, it was the first one that was there. And if you wanted to look up the, the prices of different altcoins, you went to coin market cap. And now, like, you can make a site 10 times as good. Like, you're going to have an extremely hard time to re uh, replace a uh, coin market cap. It's the same thing here. Yeah, Timos' behavior, I, I don't think many, I don't think, I haven't, I haven't met anyone who agrees with, with him. And kind of, uh, he, he is actually creating a big risks for, risk for the Bitcoin ecosystem. Like, like personally, I... Somehow, I, 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 I do think that right now, uh, like Gavin's plan is just too ambitious. And, uh, and, and maybe, maybe it should be milder. It would be something milder. Let's go from one to two and just, just try, to, try to see how lightning works. I'm, 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 I'm pretty much of, of, of that kind of, kind of thinking. But I don't like Thymos' behavior of censorship because what it risks doing is it risks creating an echo chamber so what would happen is like our bitcoin uh, becomes like this one reddit and then because of the censorship you create another reddit say r slash btc or r slash bitcoin xt and then some people migrate there and these became become like two echo chambers for the future now if you create two echo chambers two sub communities that have no links no cross communication to each other you are actually increasing the risk of a fork because when communication between humans falls down it becomes harder to to prevent wars between people like this happens on the scale of nations like if you look at the 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 war between let's the cold war much of it is actually also that 
all the Russians they are reading one kind of media and all the Americans are reading another kind of media and both come to a completely different view of the world and both find it easy to hate each other because of this different view of the world. And I think this is the kind of thing you risk with, uh, with, with censorship. That you create these two echo chambers and slowly over years uh, these two echo chambers come to completely different views of the world for Bitcoin. And then you actually increase the risk of a fork. And the actual fork might happen on some other debate. It might not even be this debate. But this kind of thing kind of creates the potential for a fork in the future. And I think that's that's pretty dangerous. So even as like a small blocks guy, quote unquote, I, I don't like uh, censorship of other opinions. I mean, that's sort of a slightly different topic, but I have always been, because our, our Bitcoin, even before they started this crazy censorship, they, they did censor, for example, Ethereum stuff and like altcoin related stuff. And I was never a fan of that either. I, I always felt like, oh, there should be a much more inclusive way of looking at it because you exactly have that danger, right? That they know you sort of like, totally ignore what's going on over here. Of course, you can argue about that. I think this is much more a debatable point. You can say, okay, our Bitcoin's about Bitcoin and like you sh shouldn't have other topics. So I, I can see that view. I think it's a legitimate view, even though personally I don't share it. I think it's like on this podcast, right? We certainly aren't, even though there's Bitcoin in the name, we certainly aren't limited to Bitcoin anyway. Uh, and I think that's, you know, personally, I... I'm a great fan of sort of, you know, being open and looking at different uh, projects, different opinions, constantly also being willing to evolve one's opinion, one's focus. And that already just by saying, okay, it's only Bitcoin and strictly Bitcoin related, you sort of cut a part there off. And, and I don't think that's a good thing. No, I, I, I agree with you. I, I don't spend a lot of time on Bitcoin Reddit. Um, so. I mean, um, I don't know exactly what happens there, but uh, now I agree with you that you know if we have censorship here, then it's, it can definitely be a problem, as you mentioned, Mayor. You know, have if if we start having two communities, then you know perhaps one day we'll just have a fork or something like that. So, but uh, how, I mean, what what are the what are some of the solutions for this? Uh, do, 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 you know, can. You know, Brian, you don't seem to think it's possible that you know another. Uh, say blockchain um, Reddit emerges because it has this one has so much traction. What do you, what do you guys think? Some of the it's, solutions. It's very difficult. I think the only way would be if you had some sort of you know community wide effort. It would be a big effort to like switch to uh, like RBTC or something like that. Of course, I don't know who controls that or how exactly the blockchain seems to involve somehow. So I think it would be essential to. Um, you know, have some sort of better governance type system first, uh, or, or at least have sort of transparent rules first. But yeah, it's, it's a big problem. I think it, it would at least be worth to make the effort to do so. And uh, unfortunately, there is definitely, uh, my perception is that some parts of the community are basically benefiting because they sort of share some of the views that Thamos has or like their opponents are being censored. So they sort of say like, okay, well, let's, let's stick with the state of censorship. It's, uh, you know, it's not the worst of us and certainly not worth it. Make an effort so that the people with having different views have the chance to have them discussed in that forum as well. So moving on to the next topic, uh, we want to also, we mentioned, we talked about Ethereum a bit earlier, but want to talk about the ecosystem a bit more. Uh, specifically, Mayor, you uh, went to DEF CON, um, which was a few weeks ago, and met a bunch of people there and did a bunch of interviews. Uh, and we'd like to get you to give us your view about the Ethereum ecosystem. You know, where do you think things are going? What are the, some of the things that you saw there that you thought were really interesting? Yeah, so, so for our listeners, I, I, I recently went to the Ethereum Dev, DevCon last month and I did around 20 interviews with people in the Ethereum ecosystem. We'll be releasing them soon. Uh, it was a really awesome conference. Um, there were there were so many, so many people that I thought were like super smart and they were all there in the room and it was organized brilliantly as well. 
when like spending five days in the in the ethereum devcon gave me the kind of appreciation of two things one is uh, like vitalik's design ideas have been vindicated on one level like vitalik came out with in in 2014 with uh, the idea that you should like the problem with bitcoin is not really that it's not turing complete scripting language but that the uh, the outputs are value value blind and uh, they they don't have uh, any state except for spent and unspent and then they created this this whole thing that uh, kind of um, takes care of this shortcoming and and when i when i think of it like around one or one and a half years back everyone was like no you are trying to solve the wrong problem this isn't a problem at all worth thinking about and uh, you look at bitcoin talk and it th that was the prevailing opinion at that time the prevailing opinion was also that ethereum could not be built and on both of these counts i i felt at the ethereum devcon that that finally there is this big community uh, and they have managed to build ethereum and also that their design choices are really good because there are applications on ethereum that i could never imagine being built on bitcoin like whatever kind of thing you imagine on bitcoin has a better incarnation as as ethereum on the simplest level if you look at satoshi dice uh in satoshi dice became really popular on bitcoin but you can actually build ether dice which has way better properties than satoshi dice in satoshi dice you actually need to send it to another central server uh your funds but in uh and that central server is probably honest but in ether dice you can completely remove that central server and your uh, funds are handled by the ethereum network at all so whatever you think of in bitcoin if you think of one application on bitcoin it's way cooler and way better on ethereum so another example might be lightning network itself right like on bitcoin the lightning network is supposed to be this network that sends money quickly around the world and uh and with low latency with high speed and with low transaction fees and it turns out that you can actually build lightning like networks on ethereum and these are called state networks and um, state networks we should have we have an interview about state networks uh from the ethereum devcon and we explain what they are there but you can basically run whole companies as state networks so instead of just sending money in lightning you can run organizations on state networks the equivalent of lightning networks on ethereum so what i could see is um what i could see is like ethereum is has definitely kind of jumped ahead as as an ecosystem in terms of the innovative potential uh potential there that said uh on the other side what i also could see is like ethereum has its has its own challenges um like one of the big challenges is scaling ethereum now vitalik had some ideas some brilliant ideas for for scalability but they they are quite undemonstrated the other the other challenge ethereum has the other two challenges ethereum has is uh, that their governance is kind of not defined now ethereum development like they have run out of the seed capital and they don't know where to raise the money from and there might be some changes come coming in in terms of how they raise uh, development money this is kind of undecided that's a big challenge and the kind of third uncertainty that i saw in that ecosystem is uh, kind of nobody knows how many ethers are going to be there like the initial idea was to have billions of ether but now they are going to switch to proof of stake and then they might go from having billions of ether to only 100 million like 200 million ethers or something like that and slowly inflating so nobody seems to know how many ethers are going to be there uh, and these are the kind of uncertainties that are there in the in the ethereum ecosystem the other interesting observation that i also could see there was many people think that side chains are going to come and they are going to kill off ethereum and there'll be root stock the side chain on bitcoin and you will be able to use bitcoin and smart contracts together and that will be the death of ethereum or something like that and at the conference i realized that it's things are a, are, are, are a bit more complicated than that and um, 
it's really hard to build a Bitcoin side chain that uh, so so Bitcoin is not Turing complete and let's say the side chain in Bitcoin is Turing complete uh, it's pretty hard for a decentralized side chain like that to be built because one blockchain that is not Turing complete will find it really hard to verify the transaction of another blockchain that is Turing complete so today on Ethereum you can actually verify Bitcoin transactions but it's impossible for Bitcoin network to verify Ethereum transactions and like there's this asymmetry because of uh, the way Turing completeness works so it might be the case that actually building Turing complete side chains on Bitcoin may prove to be an, an impossible task if that happens actually Ethereum has a really nice moat like some kind of weapon that Bitcoin can never copy and that means that Ethereum will be its own big ecosystem. That was another interesting observation. So, um, but check out the videos that I've developed for the Ethereum ecosystem. I think uh, they're quite interesting on their own. And as time goes on, we'll be covering parts of the Ethereum ecosystem on Epicenter of Bitcoin as well. So I look forward to doing that. If you have any suggestions for guests, do let me know. And we'll be, so yeah, we'll be releasing those videos uh, starting this week. So look for them on our on our YouTube channel. They're, they'll only be uh, as video episodes, so we'll, we won't be releasing them to the podcast feed. So you, you can find them at uh, youtube.com slash episode of Bitcoin. And so with that, we're almost at the end of our episode, but not quite. So, you know, as many of you know, for example, in August, I joined Eris. So I, I started like episode of Bitcoin, sort of became my my a second priority, second project. And now Sebastian, he has uh, joined a startup or he's starting a startup uh, called Stratum. So perhaps you can give us just sort of as we wrap up a little bit of a status update or let us know what's going on with that. Sure. So, um, yeah, so as you mentioned, I co-founded uh, a startup called Stratum. So there's four of us. Um, uh, Richard Catano, who is the founder of BTC Report, the great iPhone app. And he also just recently wrote a book about Bitcoin. Um, he's CEO, myself, I'll be doing uh, marketing and project management at Stratum. And then we also have uh, Stéphane Floquin, who is the uh, our CTO, and uh, François Dorléans, our, our business developer. So there's four of us, and we've started this company called Stratum. We're based in Paris. And what Stratum aims to become is uh, a, a Bitcoin as a, as a uh, Bitcoin as a service platform, so that uh, companies and developers can really, really, really easily deploy blockchain applications. So think of it as sort of Heroku for Bitcoin or for for the blockchain, where you'll be able to come onto Stratum, uh, and we'll have a SaaS model where you can essentially just bootstrap and launch um, a blockchain network. So for different types of use cases, for example, let's say you want to do a Fidelity point system, well, we'll have templates there. Um, so that you can bootstrap your fidelity point system really easily, you know, tweak a few parameters depending on your needs, and then we'll have the blockchain solution to do that for you. So we might launch that on like an Ethereum no network uh, or a private uh, tendermint network, something like that. And you know, there's loads of different use cases that we can think of for IoT, for finance, um, for um, um, yeah, uh, point systems, that kind of thing. And so we're exploring those right now. We're very much in uh, research and development mode at the at the moment, uh, and we've just uh, we're closing our round of funding, so it's all happening very quickly. It's very exciting, and uh, yeah. So we'll be talking more. I'll be talking more about Stratum as um, uh, as uh, we start communicating and releasing our beta platform, which will be in February. Um, so yeah, very excited about that. And you also wanted to talk about a certain person that we are looking for. <laughs> yeah, right. So um, we're looking for a WordPress developer. Uh, we, we've been saying that we were going to do a new website for a long time. I had been working on it and have failed to find the time to properly finish that job. So uh, we need someone to help us build a new website. And so if you're a WordPress developer, if uh, if you're 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 good at developing WordPress templates, essentially is what we need. We need uh, then get in touch with us at show at epicenterbitcoin.com, and you know, well, if if it works out, then we can work together, and we'll pay you in Bitcoin, and we'll have a brand new website.
All right. Well, with that, uh, thanks so much. That was that was our episode. Now, if you enjoyed this, please let us know. Also, we, we should uh, can f- figure out if we want to do this more often. Personally, I, I kind of like the idea of doing this, you know, every um, every three months or something like that. Uh, but let us know if, if you enjoyed this and if you want more episodes like this. I mean, of course, we'll, we'll be back with our regular episodes uh, next week. So, yeah, we, we put out new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. So, you know, you can get it on iTunes or with any podcast app. And, of course, you can get the, the videos on youtube.com slash Epicenter BTC. And as Sebastian Maher mentioned, Maher has a lot produce a lot of great interviews at DEF CON, if you're in DEF CON, I think there's 19 of them and they'll all be put out. Over it's a com- lot of content. <laughs> a lot of content, yeah. And they'll all be put out over the coming weeks. Uh, so check that out, there'll, there'll be short interviews, so you're not as long, but hopefully interesting and diverse and give you kind of a good overview and uh, impression of what's going on with Ethereum. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.